Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome once again back to the Siege of Varax. Today we're going to be looking at the brand new commander of the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army. As mentioned in the last episode, Lord Commander Julka was now officially out of a job, although only temporarily, as he had far too much of a pedigree to be overly inconvenienced by the mere act of botching a major planetary invasion and costing the lives of millions of guardsmen. And the topic of who was to replace him was a hot one indeed, with the Ecclesiarchy, the Inquisition and the Munitorum all lobbying for their own candidates, although the final choice still fell to the Lord Commander Militant Obscurus, with the backing of the Departmento Munitorum and the Administratum. So then, who was the lucky fellow chosen to pick up the... On second thought, surprisingly barbed, vicious, and poisonous looking Marshal's baton. Hmm. I wonder if it always looked like that. Oh well, regardless of whether or not this was going to be a less than rewarding command, it had to be handed to someone. And that someone was to be Marshal Arnim Kagore. Like Lord Commander Zulke, he too came from a long line of proud military nobility. But unlike Lord Commander Zulke, this would not be Kagori's first campaign. He had a long and accomplished military history behind him, including his most recent command of the 13th Paladus Siege Regiment during the Long Siege of Hive Fetis. It was this particular experience that made him so eminently qualified to take command over the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army. It would, however, be the first time that he commanded quite such a large formation in the field. Despite that, however, there was absolutely no question as to whether or not Marshal Kagori was qualified for the job, or at the very least, considerably more qualified for the job than Lord Commander Zulke had ever been. But then again, Marshal Kagori would also have to be all the more competent, because whereas Lord Commander Zulke took command over a full-strength army at the start of a campaign that they should not be able to lose, Kagori was taking command over what was at best a half-strength army, isolated from the rest of the Imperium on a hostile planet whilst under a void blockade by Chaos warships. So even though the two men's qualifications and experience were like night and day, their starting situation were also equally as radically different, if not indeed even more so. And to make matters even just a tiny, incy wincy little bit worse, once again, whilst Lord Commander Zulke had 12 years to bring the campaign to a successful conclusion, Marshal Kagori was expected to deliver results immediately, or lose his position to the many political forces that were lobbying for his dismissal in the background. At least the Marshal had a moment of respite, whilst organising the relief force he would take with him to Vrax and recruiting the necessary members for his new general staff, a task made all the more expedient by the fact that quite a few of his staffers had already been decided for him, as representatives of the various political forces that were interested in seeing the campaign be brought to a speedy and successful conclusion, though preferably under their own leadership. And whilst these enforced members of the new general staff would never overtly sabotage the new marshal's plans for fear of incriminating themselves and their own reputation, but they could also not be counted upon to place the army's best interests ahead of their own. Marshal Kagori would have to create a plan and an army composition that could not only survive contact with the enemy, but that could also survive contact with his own general staff. And the first step on the road to reaching that near-perfect balance as far as the Marshal was concerned was to find himself a bigger stick. 
For even in the darkness of the 41st millennium, the old saying still holds true. There are no problems that cannot be solved with a sufficiently large beating stick. And in this case, the stick took the form of Legio Astorum. Hailing from the forge world of Lucius, they were also known as the Warp Runners, and were justly famed for their particularly intense hatred of anything and everything warp related. And what with the recent increase in warp related nonsense on Vrax, it seemed to be the perfect target for their attention. And whilst previously they had denied requests to send Titans to Vrax because they thought it beneath them, now that there was an enemy Titan Legion and Chaos Astartes on the planet, suddenly it was all looking a bit more interesting. And now that an answer had been procured for the enemy's Titans, Next was a question of manpower and reinforcements. Marshal Kagori did not have an entirely clear picture of the situation on Vrax at the moment. He had various reports from just before and right after the Chaos Fleet arrived, but after that, as you can probably imagine, communication grew rather spotty. But he had to assume that if there even was an 88th Imperial Guard siege army left to rescue, it would have taken a fierce battering from the Chaos reinforcements, and since he couldn't exactly just teleport there, they would continue taking quite a battering for a while yet. Therefore, reinforcements and replacement regiments would have to be procured, and once again, the Death Corps of Krieg would be called upon to supply the necessary reinforcements. But not just replacements, mind you. Marshal Kagori had a different idea of how the war on Vrax should be fought. In his opinion, the problem was not a lack of faith, as the Ministorum had suggested, nor any shortcoming on the behalf of the men fighting the war. Rather, he thought that the failure on Vrax was due to the lack of offensive spirit and creativity demonstrated on behalf of the High Command. In Marshal Kagori's eyes, Lord Commander Zulka had merely succeeded in battering his men bloody against an unyielding obstacle, never taking the time to take a step back and ask himself why the object appeared so unyielding, despite however many men he threw at it. Perhaps it was a problem of support, not enough artillery for example, but no, this was clearly not the answer. The 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army was one of the highest priority armoured formations in the Imperium, and as had been handily demonstrated by the Great Push, the Adeptus Munitorum was more than willing to provide the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army with all of the ammunition and artillery pieces it required, so clearly that was not the problem. Was the problem then perhaps the men fighting the war? But no, this too seemed rather unlikely. The Death Corps of Krieg had a flawless pedigree, and they had been selected for the job specifically because they could be expected to stand up to anything the Cardinal could unleash against them, including the TP3, which of course the Imperium was more than aware of, and still not break. So clearly, it was not an error on behalf of the Death Corps of Krieg either. Could it perhaps be incompetent field officers? Many an offensive and indeed many an entire campaign had been ruined by the incompetence of those in immediate command. But once again, looking back at the history of the Siege of Vrax, whenever Lord Commander Zulka simply took his fat pudgy fingers off the control stick and handed it over to local officers, they had usually produced results. Expensive results and imaginative results to be sure, but nevertheless, results. So that too was clearly not an issue. How about general equipment then? Was the army simply not equipped to deal with the enemy in front of them? Well, looking at the initial deployment strength of the army, it appeared to be more than sufficient, both in an offensive and defensive manner. There were several siege corps, there were plenty of artillery, two full assault corps, and later on the army had even been reinforced with yet another Lion Corps, 
So clearly, the availability of men, equipment, and material in general could also not be faulted. With all of these other potential factors considered and eliminated, the only real remaining possibility then was an error on behalf of High Command in and of itself. And reading over the various reports, or more correctly, the lack of reports from said General Command Staff, and the inactivity for long periods on behalf of its Supreme Commander, Lord Commander Julke, that quite clearly appeared to be the most obvious reason for why the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army had been battering itself bloody against the Vraxian defences for ten whole years, with frighteningly little to show for it. But Marshal Kagori was determined to not repeat the errors of his predecessor, where Lord Commander Zulka had found an unmovable object and simply just kept hammering his thick skull into it, Kagori was of the opinion that if one could not move an object, it would be better to simply just go around it. Precisely how the Marshal intended to do this, considering the scale and scope of the enemy's defences and the now considerably more fluid situation on Vrax, was unclear, as he was also of the opinion that the more people who knew about a plan, the more potential ways it could leak out to one's enemies, and considering the sheer quantity of enemies within his very own command staff, that was probably a wise precaution to take. However, many of his more ardent detractors on that very command staff were already questioning his decisions when it came to the reinforcements he were gathering up to come to the 88th relief. They said that, first and foremost, the titans of the Legio Astorum were obviously needed. One did not need to be a strategic genius to decide that. And secondly, the Imperial Aeronautica reinforcements requested for the Imperial Navy were also obvious. Marshal Kagori had gathered fighter and bomber wings to combat the enemy's air superiority and also inflict upon them what they had so gleefully inflicted upon the 88th Siege Army. However, they had issues with the reinforcements he were gathering from Krieg. Of course, he was requesting yet more artillery batteries, tank formations, and infantry siege regiments. This was all well and good, but what were all of these engineer formations? Additional grenadiers would have been one thing, considering the need to probably carry out large-scale maneuverable offensive warfare on the surface of Rax, but these engineers, surely the Marshal must understand, they carpered, that the time of slow, grinding, meticulous seed warfare was past, and what was now needed was a mobile offensive force, and yet here he was investing considerable quantities of influence in securing large numbers of engineering formations, and all of this specialised equipment. Hades breaching drills, and huge quantities of explosives? What possible use could these things have in an offensive, mobile style of warfare? The Marshal had already, even before stepping foot on Vrax, they argued, gone slightly insane. Clearly crushed beneath the weight of the responsibility, now resting upon his frail shoulders. But... Despite their carpering, the Lord Militant Obscurus decided to continue to have faith in his marshal for the time being. He too was a little bit confused as to why these specific forces were needed, but Marshal Kagori, with a little wink and a nod, reassured the Lord Militant that there was a plan in place, and that he would demonstrate the usefulness of the engineering companies in due time. The last piece of the puzzle then was to acquire sufficient means of transportation for the reinforcement flotilla. Luckily, Battlefleet Scarus was more than willing to hand over sufficient Imperial Navy resources, since they also were not overly fond of the idea of a Chaos flotilla led by a battleship roaming around their own backyard.
That's the kind of nonsense that can cause no end of problems. Especially if they had an Imperial Armory world from which to resupply. The first Imperial Navy elements to re-enter the Vrax system were four Cobra-class destroyers from Ithaca Squadron. Their mission was to scout out the system and identify what, if any, enemy naval forces still remained within the Vraxian system. When they returned, however, they could report that the system appeared quiet and that no enemy vessels had been identified. This was unexpected, but not necessarily unusual. Chaos raiding forces are more than aware of the fact that they are raiding forces. If they ever get cooped up in one area for too long, the Imperium is more than willing to bring down devastating force upon them and destroy them. Therefore, most raiding captains worth their salt will hit a target and then go off and search for another soft target. Very rarely will they stick around for prolonged engagement against the Imperial Navy, and it would appear that that was what had happened here. Marshal Kagori argued that one should not take anything for granted and that the reinforcement should be escorted appropriately. Battlefleet Scarus was in agreement to a certain extent, but they were being pushed in other areas as well, and in the end the reinforcement flotilla would be escorted by two Lunar-class cruisers, the Duke de Wallet and General de Hanay, along with an escort squadron of eight Sword-class frigates and the four Cobra-class destroyers already in system. It was a force that would have been woefully lacking if it was to face off against the previous Chaos Flotilla, but if all of them were still in system, the Cobra-class destroyers should have spotted them, and if they didn't, well, then things were about to go very, very wrong indeed. And it must have been with a certain sense of trepidation that Marshal Kagori watched the reinforcement flotilla enter the system, knowing that if the Cobra-class destroyers had not done their job properly, they would be journeying into a battle where they would be severely outnumbered, outmatched, and outgunned. And the thought must have crossed the Marshal's mind that Maybe, just maybe, the reason why Battlefleet Scarus was skimping on the escorts was because certain forces within the upper echelons of Imperial politics figured that it might be best if this expedition did not reach Vrax fully intact. Unsurprisingly, the people in the convoy thought differently. And as soon as the two Lunar class cruisers were in system, they immediately routed extra power to the Augur Arrays to see if they could spot any lurking Chaos forces. Now, it may sound vaguely ridiculous to refer to a dozens of kilometer long spaceship as lurking, but as we've mentioned in the previous episode, space is very, 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 very large. And even something the size of the Anarchy's heart can potentially be quite stealthy if given the time to prepare itself. However, no positive contacts were returned to the Orga crews of neither the Duke de Wallet or the General de Hanay. Based on the best available data then, the advance would continue, with the two Lunar-class cruisers bringing up the rear and the frigates interposed between the various transport ships and out front, ready to get in the way of any potential forces that may have avoided the initial Augur scans. And for days to begin with, everything appeared to be quiet. No Augur contact reared their ugly, chaotic heads, and the convoy made good time with no indication of any hostile forces. Communication with the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army on Vrax would undoubtedly have been re-established 
fairly early on. But obviously, the poor bastards on the planet below couldn't really give the Navy much in the way of an update on whether or not there were still Chaos ships in system. All they could really do is tell the Navy that the Chaos Flotilla had not fired upon them directly for a very, very long time. But then again, that could also be to the simple fact that if they were to shoot at the 88th, they'd also be hitting the Vanaxians, and at this point also, their own allies, which they might actually potentially possibly maybe give a shit about. The information the army could furnish the incoming relief force with, however, was not of a particularly cheery nature. After the enemy's reinforcements had been arrived and the 88th Army had been cut off from their own supply lines, they had suffered considerably during the year it had taken Marshal Kagori to get his forces ready. Which, in and of itself, by the way, was quite an achievement. Marshalling a reinforcement formation of the size and complexity that Kagori had managed in such a short amount of time was quite the feat. Of course, that didn't help the poor bastards on Vrax much, but I'm sure they appreciated the alacrity. Though I am also sure that at this point, they probably just wanted whatever was coming to their aid to hurry the fuck up, because they had been fighting a losing war for a year now, with heavy restrictions on their usage of ammunition, supplies, and even just basic small arms ammunition. Now, luckily, the Lucius Patton Lasgun is a Lasgun, and so it can be recharged via solar power, but sadly, autocannons, mortars, and heavy bolters not quite so much. And even worse, they were also beginning to grow desperately low on fuel. Due to the enemy's void superiority, they were able to launch attacks against the Death Corps from any direction, landing their forces deep behind the Death Corps lines and attacking their flanks and rearward positions with very little in the way of warning which meant that the Assault Corps and its various mechanized and armored regiments had to rush back and forth along the defensive line almost non-stop, devouring literal oceans of Prometheum whilst doing so. It hadn't been long until the on-planet commanders realized that they simply could not continue to regain the ground they had previously lost. It was simply too costly, both in terms of men, ammunition, and Prometheum. They would have to begin limiting their counter-offensives, which meant that very soon, wherever the Death Corps lost ground, that ground remained lost. And over the course of the year of bitter fighting, the 88th the Imperial Guard Siege Army's perimeter shrank little by little by little. Whilst under continuous pressure from Chaos Space Marine warbands and the Vraxian traitor forces themselves, now reinforced by tens of thousands of cultists and an ever increasing number of what was originally designated as auxiliar formations, but upon further examination appear to be far more improvised in nature than originally thought. First, the Death Corps commanders thought that they were fighting various Chaos cultist forces brought in from off-world, but further examinations of the corpses dragged in from No Man's Land revealed that these did not carry the long-term scars, markings, and mutilations of long-term cultists. Indeed, a lot of them appeared pristine. Oh, well as pristine as any servant of chaos could ever truly be. But nevertheless, these appeared to be fresh initiates, and yet their armament and equipment appeared to be up to the usual Vraxian standards. The only thing that revealed them to be different from the usual Vraxian traitors were the fact that they employed none of the tactical sophistication that the Vraxian forces had so far been known for. Rather, these traitor forces frequently simply just hurled themselves at Death Corps defences. No supporting artillery barrages, no supporting armour, no mechanised push, no coordination. Hell, it barely appeared to even be any planning behind it, as 
suddenly small groups, maybe a couple hundreds, would rise from their trenches without any warning or preparation and begin rushing across no man's land, where they would almost immediately be cut down, almost uncaringly, by disciplined volleys of las guns. The heavy weapons did not even waste their ammunition upon them. Now, this may not sound very important, so what? The enemy had some new converts. They were barely battle trained and certainly not worth much in the field, as clearly they were more than happy to throw away their lives for absolutely no gain to the traitor forces. And on an isolated level, that would be correct. However, the wider ramifications and implications were considerably more disturbing. Even at the most optimistic of estimates, the Death Court of Krieg had only killed a couple million Vraxian defenders, and that would have accounted for a considerable portion of the existing defence force. And this rate of attrition had begun to have an effect upon the defenders right before the Chaos reinforcements had arrived. Even the Great Push had only finally succeeded due to a combination of daring, improvisation and bravery, but also due to the fact that the enemy had simply just ran out of reinforcements. They had been too slow to plug that final hole in their lines, and too weak to oust the enemy once they had gotten through, which led to the collapse of the second defensive line. Despite all of the Cardinal's best efforts, he was clearly running out of men, and again, before the arrival of the Chaos Reinforcements, everything had started to look mighty dark indeed for the Defenders. But of course, there were still millions more living within the traitor-held territories on Vrax. The various hab blocks had been evacuated and sent deeper within the defences, and millions of civilians were even now living beneath and inside the Vraxian citadel, around it in improvised habitation plants, and deep below in the various armament bunkers that had been temporarily, in some cases, or in other cases, permanently turned into vast underground shelters. So why could the traitors not make use of this manpower reserve? Well, the simple fact is that in modern warfare you require a considerable amount of support personnel to keep the industry of war running. Even when most of your resources can simply just be fetched out of storage, someone is going to have to fetch it, someone is going to have to organise it, someone is going to have to figure out where the various supplies are, how to get them, how to transport them, how to get them to the front line, how to keep a count on them, etc, etc. Somebody's going to have to bake bread from all of the flour. Somebody's going to have to make the food. Somebody's going to have to make all of the various little amenities that the soldiers need just to stay alive. Somebody has to mend uniforms to protect against gas. Somebody has to mend gas filters. Somebody has to build gas masks, repair the guns, etc. And for every one of these thousands of little operations, there is usually a civilian hand or two doing them. Since, of course, in such desperate times, Times, taking a soldier away from the front line to do something as pedantic as sewing clothing or baking bread would be a massive waste. There is of course also the simple fact that a considerable portion of the population will simply not be fit for frontline service. The women, for example, or the young children, or the very old. These, even if put on the front line, would hardly be of any real use, and in all your likelihood, their deployment would severely impact the morale of those already fighting, because what are they fighting for if not to protect their loved ones and their homes? It's quite difficult to keep a fire team motivated to continue fighting when Grandpa and your youngest son are deployed right alongside you. Even religious zeal and the hard glares of the disciples of Zaphon can only control so much discontent, and by and large these were still quote-unquote regular imperial citizens. They did have a breaking point. Not to mention, of course, that any new troops would have to be trained, prepared, taught how to use their weapons, and at the very least the basics of military tactics, unless they endanger the lines more than they strengthen them. 
And so, a considerable portion of the population, indeed the majority of the population, were considered to be non-combatants. But of course, that is only true in civilized, normal warfare. And if there is one thing that chaos is not, it is normal. As we talked about in a previous video, and as I talked about at length in my Explaining Chaos video, chaos in and of itself is more akin to a force of nature with certain rules and regulations placed upon it. Chaos is not necessarily an entirely unpredictable entity. In fact, it can be very predictable in certain circumstances. For example, chaos will always, regardless of its type, its nature, or its motivation, attempt to feed itself further, and thusly to grow. Now, this depends upon the scale of the chaos infestation. As we talked about, the level on Vrax was fairly low. The Cardinal and his various followers barely had any real understanding of what they were playing with. They could daub some insignia on walls here and there, or chant the occasional prayer to some half-understood deity, but all of this did not offer up much in the way of power to the various chaos forces. In fact, in most cases, they would worship some minor entity tangentially connected to the primary chaos gods, therefore once again diluting the effect. And so, whilst Chaos was still attempting to make itself more known, more understood, and therefore stronger, it could only do so to a very minuscule degree. With the arrival of the true worshippers of the Ruiner's powers, however, that influence exploded. And what was once a crudely drawn, eight-pointed star, no more than a finger-painting really, with virtually no real power, now suddenly became a true icon of chaos. All of those half-understood effigies, runes, and paintings daubed on the inside of cathedrals or inside of people's homes that previously had been essentially innocuous, pointless objects, suddenly started exerting real power and real influence upon those who saw them. Think about all of the millions of people that were still back in their homes, quote-unquote, or shelters, forced to worship, or give at least the bare minimum of religious obeisance to stay beneath the notice of the ever-watchful disciples of Zaphon. Let us, for example, imagine a housewife with a young child. Previously, she would worship at a little shrine with a crudely dabbed skull rune in pink paint. Whatever she could get her hands on, really, it was something she'd cobbled together herself. It had no power, it had no real influence, no more so than anything you or I could draw on the wall right now. But with the increase in chaotic powers, that innocent drawing suddenly became a true symbol of corn. Suddenly, the innocuous and innocent prayers this wife was offering up for strength and courage for her husband at the front to continue to resist the evil off-world invaders would slowly but surely turn into something quite different. Without even noticing it, her mind would start changing. She would stop praying for her husband and start praying for her husband to kill as many of the invaders. Seems a minor difference, right? He's still praying for his strength, of course. Then she might pray that he might be injured as well, so as to add to the carnage. Again, seems a bit off, but, you know, he's still alive. Eventually, she'll start praying just for death, just for carnage. Eventually, that'll be all she can think of. Eventually, the very idea of staying behind the front for one more day without the opportunity to drench her own hands in somebody's blood will become almost unthinkable, too much to bear, like a narcotic addiction, something that just keeps crawling at the back of your mind every second of every day for the entirety of your existence. The constant urge, the need, the desire that never lets you go, never lets you sleep, never lets you rest. That is what that harmless finger painting has become.
And of course, the Death Court of Krieg officers, they... they would know none of this. This kind of information is, for obvious reasons, strictly monitored by his most holy inquisition. However, they had fought Chaos cultists before, and they understood the changes that major Chaos cults could have upon a population. And they must certainly have known that the clock was now ticking. If the war could not be ended swiftly, and it certainly did not look likely to be ended swiftly, then very soon every single man, woman, child, young or old on the planet would become their enemy, and would throw themselves at their lines without pause or respite. If that happened before the reinforcements arrived, then in all due likelihood what remained of the 88th would simply be drowned in a tide of screaming insane civilians. Because remember, whilst there were still quite a few Death Corps guardsmen left, there were a hell of a lot more Vraxians left. And all of this information, of course, was relayed up to Marshal Kagori, who had undoubtedly suspected this already, but having it actually confirmed to him must still have been somewhat disheartening. But the poor Marshal was about to have something considerably more immediate to worry about, as it would appear as if not all Chaos forces had actually left the system after all. The reinforcement flotilla had been allowed to continue its slow, stately procession into the Vraxian system so far, but that was to end rather abruptly, as the Anarchy's heart began powering up its engines and weapon batteries and launched a close-range ambush upon the Imperial flotilla. What manner of devious sorceries were used to achieve this, we will probably never know, as the ancient Leviathan seemingly disobeyed all laws of physics, and went from silent, quiet, cold, and dead, to full readiness engine-powered and weapons firing within minutes. Its first salvo instantaneously obliterated two of the Imperial Navy escort frigates, Within moments, it had targeted two further frigates, and by the time the Lunar-class cruisers had begun their engagement, four Sword-class frigates were left spinning through the void as little more than hollowed-out wrecks. But the Anarchy's heart's immediate advantage, the close proximity from which it had launched its ambush, would also be its weakness. The monstrous old ship had undoubtedly counted upon being able to engage and destroy several transport ships before then effecting an escape of its own, but due to the rapid reaction and defensive manoeuvring of the frigates interposing themselves between the Anarchy's heart and the vulnerable transports, no transports had so far been lost. And due to the close quarters, the two Lunar-class cruisers were almost immediately within their own effective firing range. The two cruisers immediately put spreads of torpedoes into the void against the Despoiler-class battleship and its escorts, who were only now beginning to rouse themselves from the cold sleep they had hibernated in whilst waiting in ambush. This forced the battleship to turn its attention to the cruisers, and away from the rapidly retreating transport ships, as even a battleship cannot afford to ignore two cruisers at what was essentially point-blank range. And it would swiftly be proven that on this occasion, the ancient monster had taken on more than it could chew, as the close-range torpedo salvos of the two cruisers scored repeated hits across its hull, giant melter warheads burning through meters of slab armor to detonate deep within the ancient leviathan's interior, blasting hull sections open to the void, vaporizing gun batteries, and collapsing hangars. For a moment, it appeared as if the two Lunar-class cruisers had done it on the very first salvo. Surely, not even a despoiler could survive that many direct torpedo hits at that kind of range. And the two Lunar-class cruisers were also opening up 
with their other weaponry, lances and bombardment cannons hammering into the Hulk. However, somehow, miraculously, or perhaps tragically, the monster's void shields were still operational, and shrugged off most of the bombardment. And the Anarchy's harsh reply was just as devastating as the pain it had so recently suffered, and it opened up with all remaining lancers and macro cannon batteries upon its tormentors. The Duke the Valet was caught right in the middle of the Anarchy's heart's crosshairs and suffered heavily. Its void shields held up for the first minute of the bombardment before being thoroughly overwhelmed. The vessel was continuously hammered by streams of macro cannon shells and bright burning lancers, flaying her decks open to the void. Oxygen and leaks and fires were blazing across her superstructure within minutes. But in the meantime, the General Dehane had closed in on the Anarchy's other side, and had begun ripping into it with his own weapon batteries. Under fire from two Lunar-class cruisers at point-blank range and, after having suffered crippling torpedo salvos, the gargantuan vessel's void shields first began flickering and then suddenly went out entirely, leaving it bare and undefended against the General de Hanay's repeated volleys of point-blank weapons fire. Hundreds of meters of armor ran in molten rivers down the despoiler class's flanks. Internally, explosions were ripping through bulkheads, and fires were raging everywhere, and her void shield generators had been pushed to the point of immolation, causing yet further internal detonations and raging firestorms ravaging through her guts. The Anarchy's heart was an old monster, and it knew when it was time to retreat. With the transports escaping to safety, and the frigates doing likewise, the only thing the Anarchy's heart could achieve now was potentially the full destruction of the Duke de Valais, only to itself be killed at the hands of the General de Hanay. This was not to be the vessel's fate if its captain had anything to do with it, as he, or it, ordered an immediate disengagement from the battle, trying to put as much space between it and its merciless pursuer as possible. The Lunar class, however, had other worries. The Duke the Valet lay crippled and dying in the void. Hundreds of her crew had already been slaughtered by the Anarchy's heart, but tens of thousands more would die if they did not receive immediate assistance from the General de Hanay. And, to be honest, there was no guarantee, even as wounded as it was, that the General de Hanay could have finished off the despoiler. It seemed more prudent to simply disengage, let the old monster run away to lick its wound, and rather deal with it later, during hopefully more advantageous times, whilst attempting to save as many of the men possible still left upon the dying cruiser. Besides, the escort flotilla had succeeded in its primary mission. The reinforcement flotilla had remained virtually unscathed, and was even now heading safely towards Vrax, where it would unload its desperately needed reinforcements to the 88th Imperial Guard Siege Army. And with that, I'll be wrapping up yet another Siege of Vrax video. Once again, if you liked it, please do consider sharing it around to friends, family, interested parties, hell, even uninterested parties for all I care, as I am sure that the sheer quality of the production will convince them of the beauty of 40k. Well, a man can dream, can't he? Until next time, I have been Arch. Thank you all very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Until then, have a good day. Thank you.